All right, as people trickle in, I am going to get us started with some general announcements. Thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. You are here for the Get Legit Education series. Uh, tonight's brought to you by the Nevada County Cannabis Alliance. This evening's uh, webinar is on local and state cannabis taxes. Give me one second here. Okay. So, um, hello everybody. My name is Maggie. I am the Director of Membership and Education here at the Nevada County Cannabis Alliance. You are joining us today, when, uh, Thursday, February 10th, um, for Local and State Cannabis Taxes, a Get Legit webinar. Um, it is our hope with this, with our Get Legit webinar series, um, that anyone interested in commercial cannabis here in Nevada County and otherwise will take the time to tune in to these webinars educate themselves and continue to be or become stewards of the environment and of our community. Um, the Get Legit Education Series provides preparation necessary to assist um, individuals in securing a local cultivation permit and a state cultivation license, um, including webinars, support groups, business skills trainings, and a mentor program that we offer. Um, we offer, including tonight's ongoing compliance and business skill development to help people, um, people's business be successful. All of our Get Legit webinars are virtual, online. They are free of charge and open to the public. Um, all of our webinars are recorded and the recordings are all available through our website, www.nevadanccannabisalliance.org. Um, the Get Legit Education Series is a very collaborative effort with Nevada County Media, Nevada County Community Development Agency, the Nevada County Cannabis Compliance Division, the Department of Cannabis Control, the California Department of Cannabis Control, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board, the Division of Water Rights, Nevada County Tax Collectors, and the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to a few of our allied industry businesses for their amazing ongoing support um, to help make this series available. Ag Natural, Hometown Hydroponics, Foresters Co-op, Moreland Consulting, Humboldt Seed Company, Grow Generation, Rolling Hills Bookkeeping, and SC Labs. Thank you, allied industry businesses. Um, for anybody not familiar with who we are, the Nevada County Cannabis Alliance, uh, we are a nonprofit trade association representing the local cannabis community here in Nevada County. Our mission is to threefold. We support primarily to support public policy initiatives through representative advocacy. We provide educational opportunities and create space for connection within the industry and greater community. Some of the services we provide to our members consist of a consistent voice and representation locally and at the state capitol through our statewide partner Origins Council. We offer monthly industry affair calls on business development skills, compliance needs, regenerative farming practices. Um, we offer the ability to listen to all past recordings of our industry affair calls and our Get Legit webinars. We have a buddy program that pairs permitted farmers with new incoming applicants. Um, we have a robust online internal resource hub uh, for resource sharing and local policy updates, um, seasonal supply chain industry mixers, and monthly farmer meetups for members to connect and share resources and talk to one another. After to this evening, um, our next upcoming Get Legit webinar is General HR for Cannabis Businesses. Um, this is presented by local attorney Sarah Smale of the Law Office of Sarah Smale. This will be on Thursday, March 3rd, also at 4 p.m. Um, you do have to pre-register just like this evening. And again, that's on General HR for Cannabis Businesses. 
Um, a few notes just on the format for this evening. Um, we have two presentations, um, one from Amanda Rose, our, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, who is our senior accounting assistant at the Nevada County Treasurer and Tax Collector. And we also have Tracy West, who is a business tax specialist with the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, joined with her coworker, Brian Duckett. Uh, we are so grateful to all of them for their time this evening. As the presentations go, um, we want this to be, it is what you make of it, so ask lots of questions. Um, you can type questions into the chat feature and or the Q&A feature, and we will make sure um, either throughout the presentations or afterwards that we get to everybody's questions. Um, with that, I uh, will hand the mic over. We are going to start with Amanda here from the local Nevada County Tax Collector's Office. Um, and Amanda, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. Okay, can you go ahead? Can you see that okay? Looks great. Okay, um, so thank you everybody for attending today. Um, I'm just going to go over kind of an overview of the compliance from uh, the tax office standpoint. Um, I know some of you may be familiar with some of this, um, but I'm going to go ahead and just cover all the basics. And then, of course, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. So a quick background on the ordinance. Um, ordinance 2456, which is also known as the Cannabis Business Tax, went into effect on January 1st, 2019. When this went into place, um, the, it established that people engaged in commercial cannabis cultivation in the county, in the unincorporated areas of the county, um, are required to register with our office annually pay a tax of 2.5% on gross receipts each quarter. Um, that amount has actually changed, but that was the base amount that was introduced. And um, the other requirement is to meet set minimums each year based on gross cycles and square footage. So the first um, thing that we usually have businesses do once they receive either a state cultivation license or a county permit, whichever comes first, is register with our office. Um, this registration form helps get uh, your business into the system and it also provides us with information needed to establish what your minimum tax will be for the fiscal year. Um, once you register initially, you are then required to register each year. Um, you have to register by July 1st, which is when um, our fiscal year starts. And then we ask that if you have any major changes to your business throughout the year that you submit an updated registration form, um, particularly if your square footage you know, changes drastically, um, you don't have growth cycles like you thought you were going to, anything to that effect. Um, so here are our registration forms, just to get everybody familiar. The one on the left-hand side is our standard registration form. Um, this is a PDF on our website and it's fillable. Um, and then on the right hand side is our online registration form. These forms ask for the exact same information, so it really doesn't matter which form you prefer to use. Um, some people just like the paper form over the online form and that's fine. Um, so this is the form that you would fill out initially to register with us and get everything into the system. Uh, the next requirement is quarterly taxes. So tax returns must be submitted by the due date each quarter and must include metric data. Um, when we talk about metric data, we're, we are referring to either a transportation manifest, um, a transfer report, or anything um, similar that you can pull from metric, just showing that your product is being tracked and traced in the system as required. If sales do occur, then you have to pay a tax of 2.54% on the gross receipts. And that is the total amount received during the quarter before subtracting any costs. 
Tax returns and metric data are due by the due date each quarter, even if no sales or cultivation occur. Um, if no sales occur, then no tax will be due, obviously, but the tax returns and the metric data are still required. Um, so here's our standard tax return. I know it says annual registration form up here. Let's uh, don't pay attention to that. Um, our standard tax return is here. This is the paper form. Again, this is a PDF on our website that you can fill out. Um, what's nice about this form is it will actually auto calculate for you, um, especially if you are submitting a late return. It'll help you calculate any penalty and interest that might be due. Um, but if you're submitting a return on time, it'll just quickly calculate the tax due based on the current tax rate, um, which is currently 2.54%. Um, and, uh, you know, it, a lot of people prefer the paper form to the online form, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, either way is fine with us. The forms will ask the exact same information. Um, and then on the right is our online form. So these are our quarterly reporting periods and due dates. Um, so we run on a fiscal year, not a calendar year. So our fiscal year begins on July 1st each year. And then the first quarter ends on September 30th and the first return is due October 31st. And then second quarter we see here is October through December due January 31. Quarter three is January through March, due April 30th. And then quarter four is April through June and returns are due by July 31st. And again, um, these due dates have to be met even if no sales occurred, even if no cultivation occurred, but you do have a license, an active license. Um, so we always try and send out reminders about tax returns, um, you know, to try and help you guys avoid penalties and interest, um, because depending on what your gross receipts are, a penalty of 10% can be pretty substantial. So um, once a return is late, a 10% penalty is applied. And then once a return becomes more than one month late, an additional 10% penalty is applied. Uh, in addition to the penalties, interest. So interest of 1.5% is applied as soon as the return is late, and then on the first of each month following that. Um, so those things can add up quickly. Uh, we do try to help people avoid paying those when possible. Um, and then our minimum tax um, is based on the number of grow cycles and the square footage. Um, so the way that it's laid out in the ordinance is that um, e for each growing cycle, less than or equal to 2,500 square feet, um, the minimum is $1,250. Then we move to um, grow cycle of 2,500 to up to 5,000 square feet, and that is a minimum tax of 2,500. And then for people cultivating more than 5,000 square feet, it's $5,000 per growing cycle. So these are the minimums each fiscal year that have to be met. Um, so at the end of each fiscal year, we do what's called a true up. And so we take a look at all the payments that we received each quarter over the fiscal year, and we determine if those meet the set minimum. One thing that we are able to do is combine multiple cycles, uh, which allows more fairness. So for example, if somebody has four cycles of 300 square feet, rather than charging them $1,250 for each of those four cycles, we would combine that into be one cycle um, of 1,200 square feet. And so they would just pay the 1250 one time. So we are able to uh, combine cycles and and that does help people out. Um, I know I've gotten the question a lot of if they have three cycles of 5,000 square feet, do they have to pay 5,000 three times? No, we would consider that one cycle of 15,000 square feet and you would pay the minimum for the year would be 5,000. Um, and uh, I always tell people to check our website frequently. Uh, we always have the most current information on there. And anytime that our forms are updated, we uh, update our website right away. 
So you can see here, uh, we have a link to pay taxes online, which a lot of people like to use. Uh, we have links to our online forms. So we have a registration form, our quarterly return form, and then our request for relief form uh, available in online versions. And then over to the right hand side are the principal forms for those that prefer to fill out the PDFs and print those. And sometimes, you know, they bring them in or they mail them. Um, but all of those forms are available online and we always encourage people to go to the website and grab the most current form. Sometimes we do make minor updates to the forms. Um, and so we, we often encourage people to do that. Um, so why report and pay cannabis taxes? Um, not only is it an important part of commercial business activities and contributes to the community as a whole, um, the taxes are used to cover the cost of the cannabis tax program. Uh, since the tax is a general tax, the revenues from the program, if the revenues from the program surpass the costs to run the program, they're placed into the general fund. And then the Board of Supervisors determines where those funds go to help, um, you know, different needs in the community. So it's important to give back to our community. Um, it supports our community as a whole. And, you know, for cannabis businesses that are successful, um, you know, that's, it's just good for the community. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and open it up to any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much for that, Amanda. Um, we have a couple of questions here. I'll start asking from the chat. Um, the first is, do gross receipts include cultivation taxes that distributors pay for the farms? Um, so that is something that we recently got clarification on. Um, I will follow up and I can send out um, an email blast about that once I get the final answer on that. Great. Yeah. And if you could just shoot that my way too, and I'll help spread the word on, on that information. Perfect. Good question. Thank you. Um, okay. The next question here is, are there penalties for the true up? Is interest charged on that amount? Yes. So if there is um, a trip that needs to happen, say you didn't meet your set minimum, and when we're doing the true up process, we determine there's a balance due, we will send out an invoice. There is 30 days to pay that invoice um, as just the balance due. After that 30 days though, um, fees do start, interest does start to accrue on that. Um, and so again, we try and encourage people to, you know, pay that before those 30 days are up so that they don't, aren't paying extra fees. Um, we've worked with a few people um, who were struggling to pay. So, you know, if you, if you're really struggling, contact us, we'll see what we can do. Um, but yes, it can, it can add up. Okay. Um, Elise, I see that your hand is up. I'm going to attempt to allow you to talk. Um, otherwise, if the, for whatever reason, this doesn't work though, type your. Hello. I know I was starting to type it as well. Um, so I'm still confused as to how the minimum tax is calculated per growth cycle and how you're sort of combining things. So I guess I'll just look at my farm itself. So I have, you know, uh, I'll, I will have a 10,000 square foot farm with a couple of three growth cycles. So does that mean I'm looking at spending a minimum of $15,000 in tax to the county? No. So the way that it's laid out in the ordinance, that's how it reads, but we do have the caveat that we can combine those cycles. So we would consider it one cycle of 30,000, that makes sense. So we, you know, we combined the 10,000 um, into one, into one cycle. So your minimum would be 5,000, not 15. Okay, excellent. And then, cause that, that was one of my other questions as well. So, cause we're gonna, the goal is also to have multiple greenhouses running, but if all of a sudden I lose an entire crop with one greenhouse, does that mean I won't be paying taxes on that greenhouse? Um, so if something like that were to happen, um, definitely contact us and see some of those things are a case by case scenario. Um, and, you know, I usually go to Tina for those for those types of things. Um, so I, I would just suggest in that scenario to, to contact us directly. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Great. 
Um, okay, we have another question here that says, how do we declare grow cycles for nurseries? Um, can you elaborate on the question? Um, let's see. Can we get some elaborate? Is there elaboration from uh, the okay? Do nurseries pay cultivation tax? Yes, it's based on the gross receipts. Um, the same the same way that you know outdoor cultivation would. All right, and let's see. Um, okay, this might be a similar question. I'm not sure if we got this. Are the taxes based on cultivation only? Currently, the tax structure is just based on gross receipts, uh, whether that's nursery or cultivation. Um, it, at each quarter, it's just based on a percentage of gross receipts. And then the minimum is based on the square footage and, and number of growth cycles. Okay, and um, or I think there might still be questions about the nursery tax, nur how this works for nurseries, but I'm not. Um, okay, so if say I'm a nursery, if mm -hmm. it's not flowering ever, so how do we set up the quote unquote growth cycle minimum? So nurseries in the ordinance, the the minimum for nurseries is twenty five hundred. Um, so I'm not sure. That's that's basically just the minimum for the nurseries. Um, I I can send out an email blast about that as well if that would be helpful um, and point to that language in the ordinance. Um, okay, so it's, it's just preset for nursery licenses. Just for the nurseries, yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. People are welcome to continue typing questions, even if they are for Amanda, but we will move on to uh, Tracy with the state. Um, and I will hand the mic over to you, Tracy. Thanks. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, uh, no, I'm going to share this one. Sorry, I'm not used to Zoom, so no I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, that looks so, let's see. So, uh, Thank you for inviting me to present um, information on the cannabis taxes at the state level. Um, again, my name is Tracy West, and as Maggie mentioned, I am a business tax specialist, and I work in the cannabis tax program at the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, um, also known as CDTFA. And um, Brian Deckett is here to help me answer any questions um, through the chat or after my presentation. And this presentation will cover an overview of the cannabis tax law, um, which includes um, the three state taxes that are imposed on cannabis, which includes the cultivation tax, the excise tax, the sale and the sales and use tax. And we, I will also go over um, requirements for the specific license types, the retailers, distributors, manufacturers, and cultivators. I do understand that most of um, the attendees here are cultivators, um, but I, I think it might be helpful for you to maybe understand at a high level what the other requirements are for the other licensees. Absolutely. So, um, and then before I start, I have to say this before every presentation, um, that this, the information here is used only as an aid to illustrate the general tax concepts and cannot be used for um, written advice. Um, and this presentation will not address every situation. There are so many situations out there right now in the industry that I've heard. And so if you have a specific situation that you need guidance on, um, please uh, submit your request through our website 
um, at the link on the slide and um, we can respond via email and, and, and for written advice and you can rely on that advice at that time. So let's get started. Um, so as everyone knows, the California voters approved Proposition 64 back in November 2016. Prop 64 created um, or it legalized the adult use of cannabis. It created the licensing requirements and it created um, the cannabis tax law. The cannabis tax law provides for two taxes on the sale of cannabis, the cultivation tax and the cannabis excise tax. Uh, distributors um, are responsible for collecting both of these taxes along with reporting and paying those taxes due to the CDTFA. So uh, let's start with the cultivation tax. Um, some general information that the cultivation tax is imposed upon cultivators of cannabis and applies to all harvested cannabis that enters the commercial market. And cannabis is considered to have entered the commercial market once it has completed and complies with the required quality assurance review and testing. And cultivators are responsible for paying the cultivation tax to a distributor or in some cases to a manufacturer if the cannabis is sold or transferred uh, first to the manufacturer. And the cultivation tax is based on the weight and category of the cannabis that a cultivator sells or transfers to a manufacturer or distributor. There are currently three cultivation tax categories. The cannabis flowers, which means the flowers of the cannabis plant that have been harvested, dried, trimmed, or untrimmed and cured prior to any processing by a manufacturer and the flowers do exclude the leaves and stems removed from the cannabis flower prior to the cannabis flower being transferred or sold by the cultivator and then the leaves um, means all parts of the cannabis plant other than the flower that are sold or transferred by the cultivator and then the third category fresh cannabis plant means the flowers, leaves, or a combination of adjoined flowers, leaves, stems, and stalk from the cannabis plant that is either cut off just above the root or otherwise removed from the plant. And the fresh cannabis plant, um, to use that category, the fresh cannabis plant must be weighed uh, within three hours um, of harvesting and without any um, or before any um, processing by a cultivator. And the fresh cannabis plant category must be recorded in the track and trace system and invoiced as such. And so the rates uh, for these categories are posted on our website under the special taxes and fees rates page under cannabis taxes. And the link is um, noted on this slide. And um, so in addition to the cultivation tax, there is the cannabis excise tax, and, uh, which is imposed upon the retail purchaser, and it applies to the retail sale of all cannabis and cannabis products. And retailers are responsible for collecting the excise tax from their customers at the time of retail sale at the rate of 15% of the average market price. So the average market price, which is used to calculate the excise tax is based on the type of transaction that occurred between the retailer and the seller, whether that be a cultivator, a manufacturer, or a distributor of when the retailer purchases cannabis. And the transaction can either be an arm's length transaction or a non-arm's length transaction. So for an arm's length transaction, generally, um, this transaction, there must be a sale between two parties for a price that reflects the fair market value of the cannabis that is sold in the open market. And so for an arm's length transaction, the average market price is the retailer's wholesale cost of the cannabis plus a markup determined by CDTFA. And then for a non-arm's length transaction, the average market price is the cannabis retailer's 
gross receipts from the retail sale. And then an example of a non-arm's length transaction would be when a business is um, both licensed as a distributor and a retailer, and the distributor supplies um, their own um, retail location. So there's really there's no sale between the distribution part of the business and the retail part of the business. Um, so uh, let me just, I'm going to go back to the arm's length transaction real quick um, because it is a more complex calculation. Uh, so to determine the average market price in the arm's length transaction, uh, you need to know two things, the wholesale cost of the cannabis and the markup rate. And the wholesale cost is the amount paid by the retailer for the cannabis and it includes transportation charges. And then for the markup rate, CDTFA is required to determine the markup rate every six months. And this rate is only used to compute the average market price of the cannabis sold or transferred to a retailer in an arm's length transaction. So the retailers and, and all licensees may use any markup they would like to um, establish their selling price. And so, um, there we go. So um, because this uh, calculation can be complex, um, I just wanted to provide a real high level example of how the excise tax is calculated. So for this example, um, a retailer purchases uh, cannabis flowers for $7,500 in an arm's length transaction. Um, and this example assumes a markup rate of 80%, but um, but please keep in mind that the, the markup rate in effect at the time of sale or transfer to the retailer must be used um, for the calculation. So the distributor in the transaction will apply the markup rate of 80% in this case to the wholesale cost paid by the retailer to compute the average market price of the $13,500. And then the 15% excise tax is applied to the average market price of the $13,500 to compute the excise tax due of the $2,025. So the distributor in this example is responsible for collecting the excise tax from the retailer, along with reporting and paying the excise tax of $2,025 to CDTFA on their cannabis tax return. And um, so our current markup rates are always posted on our website um, in the same location as the cultivation tax rates on the uh, special taxes and fees rates page. Uh, okay, so now um, I'm going to move on to go over some of the basic business requirements that a cannabis business may have with CDTFA. So first, any type of business that sells tangible, tangible personal property, which includes cannabis, in California is required to register with CDTFA for a seller's permit. And then secondly, any person required to be licensed with the Department of Cannabis Control as a distributor is required to register with CDTFA for a cannabis tax permit. And this permit is in addition to the seller's permit. So our online registration is available on our website. Um, to start the registration process, uh, you can go to our homepage and in the middle of the homepage, you'll select register online. Um, and this will bring you to our um, information page on our online services for registration tab. You'll, you will collect get started. And then this will take you to our online services page. And for those of you that may already have a permit with us, this may look a little familiar. This is where you would sign into your online account uh, to report um, a sales and use tax or the cannabis taxes to us. Um, but to register for a new business activity, you will select um, this link and it, this link will take you to uh, the beginning of the registration process, was, which starts out with a questionnaire of um, what your business activities are. 
And since uh, for a cannabis business, you would select uh, the checkbox for cannabis business activities and then click next. And then, um, and then the system will then lead you through the registration process based on how you answer the system's questions. And the system will then determine which permit is required based on how you answer those questions and whether it's a seller's permit, the cannabis tax permit, both permits or sometimes you don't even, you don't need a permit with us. It just depends on your situation. Um, so now I'm gonna go over general requirements for each business type. Uh, and I'm gonna start with retailers. Uh, retailers are required to register for a seller's permit and report their sales and pay sales tax due to CDTFA. Uh, retailers may reimburse themselves by collecting sales tax from their customers. And sales tax is based on gross receipts at the time of sale. And the sales tax rate is based on where the sale takes place, when the sale is over the counter, or when the retailer delivers the items directly to the customer. And retailers are also required to report any um, and pay any use tax on taxable items that they have purchased without paying sales tax and then use at a later time. And I'll go over that in a little more detail because it may affect cultivators as well. And then uh, certain sales of medicinal cannabis and cannabis products are exempt from sales tax. The exemption applies when the retail purchaser provides the retailer with a valid medical marijuana ID card issued by the Department of Public Health and a valid government ID card at the time of pur purchase. And this exemption only applies to sales tax. There is no exemption from the cannabis excise tax or the cultivation tax for the sale of medicinal cannabis or medicinal cannabis products. And uh, Department of Public Health has um, a website that allows anyone to verify the validity of the medical marijuana ID card. And that link is on, um, noted on the slide. So next, retailers. Um, uh, for resale certificates, uh, retailers um, should provide a resale certificate to the licensee that they buy cannabis from. So if they are buying cannabis from directly from a cultivator, the cultivator should have a resale certificate on file from that um, retailer or any other licensee for that matter. Um, the resale certificate allows you to buy resale inventory without paying sales tax to the seller. And uh, the resale certificate should be uh, provided timely and completed. There is a CDTFA 230 form called the General Resale Certificate that is available on our website that retailers will generally use um, as the resale certificate. And then I did want to note that resale certificates cannot be used to buy um, personal items for use. And there is a penalty for the misuse of a resale certificate. And then for the use tax um, that I mentioned in a prior slide, uh, the use tax is due on goods that are um, used or consumed and purchased without paying sales tax. Uh, this use tax is the same rate as the sales tax. And then in general, use tax will apply to any goods that you may have purchased from outside of California um, without paying the California sales tax, or if you remove any items from your resale certificate, or I'm sorry, from your uh, resale inventory for use. For example, a retailer may um, remove cannabis from their um, inventory to use as a display on their shelf. And then I also want to mention, since I um, said purchases from out of state, it is important to note that interstate commerce of cannabis is still not allowed. So uh, you cannot purchase cannabis from outside the state to sell inside in California. However, generally, you would owe use tax on any equipment, supplies, or any other non-cannabis products 
purchase outside of California without paying the sales or use tax. So in addition to, um, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong screen. Um, so retailers are required to file their sales and use tax returns. Um, the return is separate from their income tax return. They should know the return due date to ensure um, uh, timely filing and paying of the taxes. Uh, there is a 10% um, penalty for filing late or paying late. And then in some situations, retailers may be required to pay monthly prepayments, and, which depends on the amount of taxable sales they report. And the retailers will be notified in advance if they are required to make prepayments. Uh, retailers should keep copies of their returns um, for their records, and they can always call our 1-800 number for assistance on how to file um, their return. And then in addition to the sales and use tax requirements, retailers are responsible for collecting the excise tax from their customers. And um, as I previously mentioned, the excise tax is 15% of the average market price. Retailers are not required to itemize the excise tax on receipts that are provided to their customers. However, customer receipts um, must state that the cannabis excise taxes are included and the total amount of the invoice. And then unlike sales and use tax, cannabis retailers do not directly report or pay the excise tax to CDTFA. Instead, retailers will pay the excise tax to the distributor that supplied them with the, with the cannabis. So now, um, next distributors. Um, distributors are required to register with CDTFA for a cannabis tax permit, and this permit is separate um, from any other permit and in addition to the seller's permit. Distributors are responsible for collecting the cultivation tax and the cannabis excise tax, and distributors must electronically file a cannabis tax return to report and pay any cannabis tax amounts due to CDTFA. Um, distributors should ensure they obtain the appropriate business licenses, such as their distributor license through the Department of Cannabis Control, along with any um, local government licensing requirements. Um, if the distributor is making sales and not just transporting cannabis, uh, the distributor is responsible for the same requirements as the retailer, including registering for a seller's permit, filing sales and use tax return and issuing resale certificates when purchasing products from other licensees for resale and obtaining resale certificates from retailers um, to whom the distributor sells cannabis to. And then the sales and, tax, sales and use tax returns um, would still need to be filed even if all sales are for resale and there's no sales tax to report. Um, the return would just be a, a the gross sales would all be ex exempt from the sales tax and it would be a zero, zero sales tax due. Um, and then I also wanted to mention that there is another type of business that may operate as a distributor and that's a microbusiness license type. A microbusiness is required to hold one license but is authorized to operate more than one type of business activity. So for example, a micro business may operate as a cultivator, a distributor, a manufacturer, and a retailer. Micro businesses that operate as a distributor is, um, are responsible for all the same requirements as if they were licensed as a distributor, including registering for a cannabis tax permit, collecting the cannabis taxes, along with filing and paying the cannabis taxes due to CDTFA. So um, I kind of already, I kind of already went over this, but um, distributors are required to collect the cultivation tax. And the cultivation tax is based on the weight and category of the cannabis, um, whether it's flowers, leaves, or fresh cannabis plant. 
distributors will collect the cultivation tax from cultivators or from manufacturers. And the tax is due when the cultivation tax is due when the cannabis enters the commercial market. And again, cannabis is considered to have entered the commercial market when it has completed and complies with the required quality assurance review and testing. The distributor is required to provide a invoice or receipt to cultivators and manufacturers uh, they, um, that they collect the cultivation tax from. Uh, the receipt, among other requirements, will um, need to list the amount of cultivation tax collected. And this receipt serves as verification for the cultivator and manufacturer that the cultivation tax was paid to the distributor and it relieves them of their liability for the cultivation tax. And then the distributor that arranged for the required testing and quality assurance review is the distributor responsible for reporting and paying the cultivation tax to CDTFA. Uh, again, the distributors are required to collect the excise tax and they will collect the amount of excise tax due on cannabis they supply to retailers and collect that amount from the retailers. And as a reminder, the excise tax is calculated based on the 15% of the average market price. And then also, as with cultivation tax, distributors are required to provide an invoice or receipt to retailers uh, listing the amount of excise tax collected. And then this receipt serves as verification for the retailer that the cannabis excise tax was paid to the distributor and relieves them of their liability for the cannabis excise tax. And the distributor that sells or transfers cannabis to the retailer is responsible and liable for paying the excise tax to CDTFA. And then here is just a, a real high level example of how the cannabis taxes um, will transfer between licensees uh, and ultimately be collected by the distributor to report to CDTFA. Um, so here it shows the cultivator paying the cultivation tax to the distributor. And then the distributor pays the cultivation tax to CDTFA. And then the distributor will supply the retailer with um, cannabis and will collect the cannabis excise tax from the retailer. Then when the retailer sells the cannabis at, um, in a retail sale, the retailer will collect the cannabis excise tax from their customer. And then this next, um, this next, this next flow chart adds a manufacturer in the transaction. And as you see, the cultivator pays the cultivation tax to the manufacturer. Um, and then the manufacturer will pass on the cultivation tax to the distributor when the manufacturer sells their sells or transfers their cannabis product. And the distributor will then pay the cultivation tax to CDTFA when the cannabis product um, passes the required testing and quality assurance review. And then again, the distributor supplies the retailer with the cannabis product and the retailer is required to collect the excise tax from their customer at the retail sale along with the sales and use tax. And then the retailer is responsible for reporting the sales and use tax to CDTFA on the cannabis sold in a retail sale. So, um, Distributors are responsible for filing their cannabis tax returns, and this is separate from the sales and use tax return. Again, they should know, um, be aware of the return due date to ensure timely filing and paying. Uh, with cannabis taxes, there is a 10% late payment fee along with the 50% um, penalty, which is pretty steep, and um, that penalty is in statute and required, unfortunately. And then um, the cultivation tax is reported on the return um, for any cannabis that entered the commercial market during the reporting period. And the excise tax is also reported on the same return for cannabis sold or transferred to a retailer during the reporting period. 
and distributors, again, should keep copies of the returns filed with CDTFA for their records. So requirements for cultivators and manufacturers um, with CDTFA, uh, they are required to register for a seller's permit, um, obtain resale certificates from licensees that they sell uh, cannabis to, and then file sales and use tax returns, even if there's no um, sales tax to report, uh, you are still required to file um, a zero return. Um, and then also report and pay any use tax um, on taxable items that you may have purchased without paying sales tax. And then cultivators are responsible, again, for paying the cultivation tax to the distributor, or in some cases, the manufacturer. And the manufacturers are responsible for collecting the cultivation tax from the cultivator and then forwarding the cultivation tax onto the distributor or the next licensee in the transaction. So there are certain cannabis taxes that do not apply to um, in some situations. The um, one is the donations of medicinal cannabis. Retailers may donate free medicinal cannabis to cannabis patients or another licensee um, may donate free medicinal cannabis to retailers for the retailer to donate to the medicinal cannabis patient without payment um, of certain taxes. So the cultivation tax does not apply to medicinal cannabis when a cultivator designates the cannabis for donation in the track and trace system. Uh, the, this designation must be initiated by the cultivator for the cultivation tax to not be due. The excise tax and the use tax do not apply when a cannabis retailer donates free cannabis or free medicinal cannabis to the medicinal cannabis patient. And then also the use tax does not apply when another licensee donates medicinal cannabis to the retailer for the retailer to donate the medicinal cannabis to the cannabis patient. So a medicinal cannabis patient is a um, qualified patient who possesses a qualifying physician's recommendation or a medical marijuana ID card uh, issued by the Department of Public Health. And the cannabis licensee that receives the medicinal cannabis for, donate, for donation must certify in writing to the licensee donating it that the medicinal cannabis will ultimately be donated to a medicinal cannabis patient. And cannabis licensees may use a document such as a um, purchase order, preprinted form, or when we do also have a CDTFA 230-CD, a cannabis tax exemption certificate um, as written certification that the medicinal cannabis will be donated to a cannabis patient. And this form is available on our website. And this certification relieves each cannabis licensee in the transaction for um, any applicable tax liability. And if a cannabis licensee certifies in writing that the medicinal cannabis will be donated and then later sells or uses the medicinal cannabis, the certifying licensee will be liable for any taxes that would be due, which includes the cultivation tax, the excise tax, and the use tax. Um, so another um, situation where cannabis taxes would not be due is on cannabis trade samples. And this is a fairly new law that recently passed where um, certain cannabis licensees um, are allowed to provide and receive free cannabis trade samples. Cultivators, manufacturers, and distributors can designate cannabis as a trade sample and then provide free trade samples to certain other licensees. Uh, the cannabis event organizer, a distributor, transport only licensee, or a test and laboratory are the license types that are not allowed to uh, provide or receive trade samples. And then a cannabis retailer can receive free cannabis trade samples but cannot designate or provide free trade samples 
to other licensees or to the end consumer. So the excise tax does not apply to cannabis that is designated as a trade sample and given for free to other cannabis licensees. Cultivation tax also does not apply to cannabis that will be or has been designated as a trade sample. The cannabis licensee that receives cannabis as a trade sample and then later sells the cannabis um, is liable for the cannabis excise tax and the cultivation tax due. And if the cannabis sample is sold in a retail sale, then the sales tax is due on that cannabis sold. And then similar to um, donations, documentation must be kept and examples of a documentation include a letter, invoice, or a preprinted form. Um, and this documentation should be kept by each licensee in the transaction to document the receipt and transfer of cannabis trade samples. Uh, you can also use the, two, the form I previously mentioned under donations, the CDTFA-230 CD, the Cannabis Tax Exemption Certificate, as a written certification that the cannabis uh, was provided or received for use as trade samples. And then this documentation, um, along with the donations, I didn't mention that under donations, but the documentation should be consistent with the transactions recorded in the track and trace system. And for record keeping requirements, all cannabis licensees, um, so, sorry, my screen froze for a minute. Um, so every, um, all cannabis licensees are required to keep accurate records of commercial cannabis activity for a minimum of seven years. Uh, licensees must make those records available upon request. And records can be in the hard copy or in an electronic format. And then every sale or transport of cannabis or cannabis products from one licensee to another must be recorded on a sales invoice. And the sales invoice must include the name and address of the seller and purchaser, the date of the sale or transfer, the invoice number, the description of the cannabis, um, which includes the kind, quantity, size, and capacity of the packages of the cannabis. Uh, invoices should also include the cost to the purchaser, including any discounts that may have been applied to the price on the invoice. The location of transport of the cannabis, um, unless the transport was from the licensee's location that sold the cannabis. And then um, the amount of cannabis taxes collected, if applicable, um, and how the tax was calculated. So, for example, when a manufacturer or distributor collects cultivation tax from a cultivator, the receipt or invoice uh, should include the weight and category of the cannabis that was used to calculate the cultivation tax. And then any um, other additional information required by the Department of Cannabis Control. So for more information, we do have a tax guide for cannabis businesses. And to locate this guide on our website, um, on our homepage, there's a tax resources option to click. And then under that, there's an industry guide. And then once you click that, it will take you to the industry and tax and fee guides page. And then you will select the option for cannabis businesses. And that will take you to our tax guide for cannabis businesses. And um, this guide is your best resource. We have a lot of information on this page. Uh, the guide contains tabs at the top, um, specific, um, which includes specific information for distributors, retailers, cultivators, and manufacturers. We do have a videos tab. And right now we have one video that uh, shows how to file a cannabis tax return. We have a tax facts tab that includes um, our frequently asked questions and the responses to those questions. And then our resources tab includes uh, useful links um, to such as our special notices, 
our publications, um, any regulations, and uh, we do include other agencies, other state agencies involved in the cannabis industry. And we update this page on a regular basis. So I encourage everyone to, um, to, uh, to check back on a regular basis to see if there's any new information. And then when we do provide new information, we also send out special notices, notifying the industry of what's changed. And so if you can't find what you're looking for on the tax guide, um, you can also call our 1-800 number uh, Monday through Friday, um, except state holidays. There's also a 24 hour vo voice recording option. And um, I believe this is more specific to sales and use tax. Uh, there isn't much um, information on that part for cannabis taxes. And then like I mentioned earlier in my presentation, um, you can submit um, your questions um, in writing to us and we will respond, respond back in writing. And then one last, last thing, I know this is a lot of information. <laughs> um, you can also receive our latest news um, that is provided by our programs, including our newsletters, um, any uh, regulation changes and or other announcements by subscribing to our email list at um, the link uh, noted on the slide. And then specific to cannabis outreach, if you check this box, um, you can receive uh, updates on our um, cannabis information to the industry through email. So thank you for taking your time to listen to my presentation. Um, hopefully it was helpful. Uh, this, um, and I'm not sure if Brian was answering any questions on the chat, um, but is there any questions? Thank you so much, Tracy. That was mm -hmm. awesome, very informative. Um, we definitely have some questions that I will start going through here. Um, I just want to verbally acknowledge the one that Brian did respond to. Um, the question was, are smalls still considered quote unquote flower and taxed as such by the state? To which Brian responded, yes, smalls currently fall under the cannabis flower category. Right. Um, okay, next question. Um, I do have one question if um, that is regarding the local taxes real quick. Um, Amanda, if you're still on, um, there was a question in terms of Nevada County local taxes about if, um, if a cycle is planted but never harvested. Um, I can think of a couple instances where this happened just this past fall due to late greenhouse plantings. Um, and then there being the an atmospheric river or frost or something in terms of just sort of blowing a whole planting and whether they that has to um, be paid tax minimums on locally. So if there's a planting that's not hard, that never makes it to harvest. So no, um, the minimums are only going to apply if a harvest actually occurred. If a harvest does not occur by the end of the fiscal year, so June 30th, and it moves into the next year, then the minimum will, will shift to the next year as well. Great, thanks. Okay, um, Tracy, I have another, okay, some questions for you. Um, in terms of, for the state, how to invoice so that we won't be responsible for cultivation tax if distribution or retail doesn't pay it? So from a cultivator's point of view? Yes, and actually I've gotten a variety of questions about, uh, from cultivators about invoicing in regards to, um, Lots of invoicing things because I think it, invoicing is where it comes. It seems like it comes down to with these ta like the tax following through in the supply chain appropriately. Right. Um, right. I know it's. Um, I know it can be complex, and I have heard the issues from the industry on the cultivation tax invoicing. Um, 
And so I have heard that distributors may um, pay the net balance due to the cultivator, take out the cultivation tax, but the distributor really is required to provide the cultivator um, a separate invoice or receipt to that cultivator showing the amount of cultivation tax due. And then um, once the cultivator receives that invoice, um, they're li I mean, they're no longer liable for that cultivation tax. It is really on that distributor to report and pay it to us. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, and then also I did want to mention that we do conduct audits and um, we just started to do audits on our distributors that report to us. And so if there's any discrepancy found, you know, the cultivator may get involved or, you know, it just depends on the situation. I know that there are lots of nuanced situations. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to avoid tr translating <laughs> the, the very s individual specific questions that I've received. Um, so another question I have here for you. So this could be situational, but it's just I've, I've heard this actually a number of times. Um, if product is there's a lot of cultivators who are now distributors are, are asking for product on consignment um and things that leave the cultivator and it it with without being able to predict um there are circumstances in which this product after a unknown period of time is returned to the cultivator and or you know if something is yeah just if if there if something is quote unquote wasted in metric um if there are i don't know if taxes ever get refunded or anything but how they sort of move backwards in the supply chain right so um so if the cultivator paid the cultivation tax to the distributor uh, the cultivation tax is due and imposed once the cannabis enters the commercial market. So once it enters the commercial market, which is when they when it passes that required testing and quality assurance review um, at the distribution level, that's when the tax is due and imposed. So if it is um, destroyed after that point, that cultivation tax is unfortunately still due on that cannabis. But I have heard in some cases where on consignment, they it may not have um, gotten to that point yet, and if that's the case, um, and the distributor did collect the cultivation tax from the cultivator, but then ended up returning it back to the cultivator before the cannabis entered the commercial market, that distributor is required to return that cultivation tax back to the cultivator. And, um, okay. and then, or if they, for some reason, they don't return it, it is, they are still required to pay it to CDTFA. And I think that's kind of the situation where I'm hoping that we would um, find during our um, audits, our regular audits. Thanks. Um, next question. Is there a process for designating we aren't planting or harvesting for a cycle or for an entire year in, in hopes of reducing whatever possible fees can be reduced if you are um, taking a year off or a, just a cycle off? Is that Amanda's question? Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just making sure. Um, Amanda, I'll, I'll repeat that for you. Thank, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, the question is, is there a process for designating that a cultivator is going to um, it not plant and harvest for a cycle or for an entire um, year. So then you would put on the registration form, it asks um, how many harvests, how many cycles, it asks all that information. So you just wanna make sure that whatever you put on the registration form is accurate and then say we get into the fiscal year and it changes, just submit a new, an updated registration form, and then we can update our records accordingly. Okay. Um, so if you put just zero in cycles, so like the, the minimums 
aren't there anymore and just in terms of overall um if i were to just not cultivate at all this coming year am I, are there any tax payments that i'm still going to be required to be paying for our office no so if you're not going to be cultivating and harvesting anything basically not using that square footage um, we do verify with cda um, but if you're truly not using that square footage then there's no minimum for us to tax you on because har harvests are not occurring okay great um i'm assuming tracy in your wheelhouse that is the same you know obviously if you're not putting any product into the marketplace that you're not being cultivators or would only be expecting that cultivation tax. And so that wouldn't be taking place there either. Correct. Right. Um, Tracy is 280 E in your wheelhouse. Um, that is under the franchise tax board. That's um, right. Okay. We will keep those questions for a different date. <laughs> <laughs> in filing things. Um, all right. What other, uh, if folks have other questions, please feel free to type them in to the chat or into the Q&A. Um, Alina, in response to your question, um, this whole webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available through the Alliance website um, in the coming weeks and as well as uh, through the Alliance Slack, ne Slack network and internal channels there. Um, and I will just reiterate, if people have questions about filing taxes, or if you think that somehow you are not filing taxes correctly, um, please reach out to myself or to Amanda or to Tracy or to Brian. There are many people um, to assist to make sure that you're not overpaying, to make sure that you're reporting correctly, um, all of that good stuff. Elise, I see your hand up. Um, here, I will unmute you again. Hello, sorry, this is <laughs> it's so much faster to talk than it is to type. Um, so I have a question. So I'm still in the permitting process, but everything is so close to being wrapped up. But last year for the permitting process, I had to file for my seller's permit, but we didn't actually have, we're not actually permitted cannabis operators yet. And so I haven't, was I supposed to be filing say like the seller's permit tax things this entire year, even though we're not even licensed yet? Like, I guess I'm just kind of wondering with that whole sort of gray period, how that works exactly. Right. Um, sorry, I missed the beginning of your question. So you have a seller's permit already? So we applied for a seller's permit last year when we were beginning the entire going legit process and the whole application process. Okay. But we're not actually licensed cultivators yet but we have a seller's permit as a part of the application process. Okay. But obviously we haven't sold anything. We haven't done anything. Right. Um, so I, I feel like they may have put your seller's permit on pause. If you haven't received any notices from us, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, I do know in some cases it takes a while to get your license and to um, actually conduct business. And I have heard that our registration will put um, an application on pause until you're ready to use it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. And now is the moment if people have additional questions. Um, and I will just reiterate, this is being, this has been recorded um, and will be available for everybody to tune back into, um, as well as we, uh, yes, just ongoingly always ask questions and get the support you need if you have, if you're not feeling fully secure about what you're filing or how you're um, handling your taxes. 
if nobody else has questions at this time, I will give everybody back their evenings. I just want to thank you, say thank you again to Tracy and Amanda. Your presentations were extremely informative. We are very grateful for your time this evening um, and ongoingly in the work that you're doing. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us. I will remind you that the next uh, Get Legit webinar is on March 3rd and is H General HR for Cannabis Businesses. Um, very insightful and useful information. So please register for that and tune in there. And again, uh, reach out to us at the Alliance or to any of the tax folks on this call if you have questions regarding taxes. Um, we are here to help and we want you to have a successful business. Um, thank you everybody and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye.